There's a river of my people, and its flow is swift and strong, flowing to some mighty ocean, though its course is deep and long, flowing to... I'm Gavin Barker, and this is the pilot episode of River of My People. River of My People is intended to be an experimental oral presentation derived from research I'm doing for a book regarding the Black River and adjacent communities from Watertown to Dexter, New York, and those streams and trickles which feed it. River of My People episodes represent small, dense slivers of research along the way, but more importantly, they represent some of the exciting particularities that animate and enrich our lives and understandings of place. Maybe then we can employ a comprehensive and critical historical perspective toward a more enriching and meaningful future. For the first episode, we will be taking a look at the famous, mysterious, and alluring caves of the Black River Basin and the ways in which they have come to influence our folk histories of the river and our communities. Before we really begin, it is worth noting that this discussion will necessarily focus on the geological, cultural, and social history of the caves and will not be disclosing locations as to prevent vandalism, damages, trespassing, injury, or death. This is a long-standing component of splunking etiquette, and for the sake of preservation and liability, we understand and are going to honor such requests. A 1958 report prefaces itself with the notice that, quote, the city of Watertown and much of Jefferson County are quite cave-conscious and have a wealth of folklore, the legend, myth, and some real history that has grown out of the many holes in the ground that exist in this region. It must be understood that these which follow are not necessarily history, but merely myths, legends, and old hearsay about these hollow places in the ground, which to many people are the breeding spots of the curious and mysterious. I like this because it emphasizes the fact that while the subterranean allure has produced exaggerated, mysterious, and sublime accounts from the caverns or landscape, the history, attraction to, and meaning of the holes in the ground are still intimately connected to these mythic stories and regional written and oral histories. Most of the caves in the region are found within a narrow layer of limestone, limestone that is bigger and more resistant than most and highly jointed, resulting in massive blocks. As groundwater flows toward the river, it runs underground through these joints. The joints widened, the water table dropped and left us with the labyrinths, chambers, and horizontal passages that we know today. Now this is a much more complex process, but this is a basic understanding of karst hydrology and geomorphology that formed many of these caverns. So the indigenous history of the region, and of the continent in general, is a complicated, lacking, and misunderstood history with immense political, moral, economic, and cultural implications and cannot obviously be fleshed out completely in this episode, and much more time will be focused on this in the future. However, it is important to have some context and to think of some of the ways in which Native American history figures into that of the caves, for better or for worse. Most literature or local histories have tended to pass the lack of artifacts of what would be traditionally considered significant or permanent habitation as evidence that the Black River Valley and the county at large was only a seasonal hunting ground, temporarily used for food and to be passed through and route to places beyond. However, there's always been evidence pointing to older and more established settlements, such as extensive Perch Lake mounds, other mounds and camps, tools, bones, and more. With this, we can assume that the Black River most likely played a role in the lives of indigenous quote-unquote New Yorkers, though it's not abundantly clear as of yet in what ways the river affected their lives. This will become more clear with time, research, linking in collaboration with indigenous groups, and will get an episode of its own when the time is right. There is one brief way that the Native Americans have concretely influenced the story of the caves, and that is through the local folk history's prevalent mention of the various caves being shelters or hideouts for Native Americans. Some stories have mentioned glyphs and drawings on cave walls, although no evidence, access, or images have been presented publicly. And while there is also significant evidence that indigenous peoples had a more established presence in Jefferson County than traditionally understood, most of the specific stories are part of a sort of romantic local history, looking back to the quote-unquote beginning, a notion also charged with many complex political and cultural dimensions. 
While there were plenty of cave entrances lining the Black River in the early 19th century, it was historically noted that the first exploration in the area was in 1822. This was an expedition into a now completely sealed and inaccessible cave system near the north side of the Mill Street Bridge. In a 1935 exploration by Judge Phillips, however, it was allegedly discovered that there was an inscription reading 1809 on one of the chamber walls. On a later expedition, Phillips and Ernest C. Gould found a corked bottle containing a piece of paper dated 1911 and listing the names of Roy Carter, Charles Babcock, and John W. Bragger. This acts as evidence that 1. These caves were most likely being explored from very early on in the settlement of Watertown, Pamelia, and Brownville, and 2. That people enjoy leaving traces of their presence in these caves and in general. This particular cave, which is totally inaccessible, was the subject of many romantic descriptions, including F.D. Huff's mention of deposits of dazzling whiteness, basins and cells of snowy white agaric mineral filled with limpid water, and his condemnation of the wanton depredations of visitors who removed and destroyed much of the mineral beauty of the cave. Passages emphasize the chambers, vaults, pillars, and intersecting avenues, but as most of these descriptions go, there tended to be lots of unproven local lore about fabulously huge caverns, thousands of feet of interconnected chambers undergirding the entire city, and general exaggeration of size and subsequent retellings and incorporation of these explorations into a local folk history. One of the Watertown Caves, most probably this one, is referred to in Frederick Marriott's 1843 book Monsieur Violette, in which Joseph Smith, the Mormon leader, tricks an old Dutchman into getting a free trip to Manchester, New York, by claiming he found a bar of gold the size of his leg in a cave in Watertown, New York, and would need the help of the Dutchman and his wife to retrieve it. The last recorded visit to the cave was by Floyd Bresnahan in 1942 during an investigation into the possibility of using Watertown's caves as air raid shelters. However, it is safe to assume that there was a pretty consistent unofficial exploration of the region's caves between the various recorded historical excursions, and that residents potentially could have been in this specific cave for many years after Bresnahan. However, as emphasized twice before, this cave is assumed to be 100% inaccessible and sealed, and unless other connections are made via other caves, it will be a long, long time before this cave is accessible which is why naming its approximate location doesn't put much at risk and arguably helps keep the memory of its existence circulating. There is recorded evidence of another pre-1822 exploration of a cave, this time by General Jacob Jennings Brown of Brownville, his aide, and several others who ventured from Brownville to one of the cave entrances in Glen Park on April 16, 1819. It is unknown what side of the river they were on, but General Brown's aide noted that they made their way into the earth, twisting into romantic prose about the innumerable intersecting passages, the play of light on the walls, water, and faces of men, and the unearthly, grave-like quality of the cave. The aide also mentions the capture of several bats from a colony and his subsequent releasing of them upon arrival in Brownville. These caves have been defining features of place from the beginning of post-contact settlement. Back in the city of Watertown, we take a look at another well-known, historic, and also publicly visible cave, the Newell Street, or Ice, or Beer Cave. On the Veterans Memorial River Walk, one comes upon a metal door fixed into the escarpment near a small group of picnic tables. It is easy to see that a large section of this escarpment is filled in with bricks and stone aside from the sealed entrance, showing one how large the original entrance was. This cave has been victim to the exaggerations of the local, with some interviews in the 1958 report describing this cave as undermining the entire city. While there very well could be blocked or unknown passages, and while there are probably extensive caverns underneath the square and other areas of the city, this cave, in actuality, only extends a few hundred feet beyond the entrance. However, this cave is also relatively complex, constraining, and has been the site of at least two significant successful missing person rescue operations. It might also be worth noting that the New York Central Railroad went directly above the cave in some spots, potentially leading to breakdown and destruction of connections that are alleged to have existed. This cave, like some of the Glen Park Caves, is sometimes called an ice cave because in the spring and summer months, the retained cool air produces thick and impressive ice inside of the cave, sometimes shooting a chilling fog out of its entrance in the hottest summer months. 
Because of this ice and temperature, the cave was also used at a time to store beer. One of the more successful, r significant rescue operations inside the cave was led by Sergeant Touchette sometime in or slightly before spring 1941. Two missing boys were traced to the cavern and the party went in to find them. They described constricting and muddy passages, uncomfortable darkness, and animal tracks. The children were located and extracted, and the entrance to the cave was more securely sealed. I believe some of the presently visible bricks could be from this ceiling. Two men removed some bricks in the summer of 1996, entered, and became lost in the cave. They allegedly burned paper money for light and were rescued by firefighters two days later. When the Niagara Frontier Grotto was mapping the cave in 2013, Splunkers ended up finding the wallet of one of the missing men. Many of these caves in the Black River Basin are marked by a history of getting lost, eventually leading to most of their entrances being sealed by the 1990s. Another complex system of caves, and arguably the most impressive in the region, are the various caves making up the Glen Park complex. At Glen Park, the maze caves run in parallel and intersecting joints and run for more than 14,000 feet. Many of these caves were discovered separately, and subsequent expeditions discovered links between layers and what were assumed to be different complexes. A more detailed discussion will take place in the book and follow-up episodes because there is so much information about these caves. One of the caves, called the Commercial Cave, was a popular component of the commercial recreation operation run by the Watertown Streetcar Company in the late 1890s. Parties would enter the cave, which was electrified and had some basic stairs or railings, explore, or sometimes get married. There was a boom of such marriages in this era, with there being mentions of an altar rock in one of the Watertown Caves, Howe's Cavern, and many other historical commercial caves in the country. As an aside, it is important to know that these local histories, especially regarding the caves, get mistaken and jumbled around consistently. Therefore, the altar rock that was listed as being in one of the Watertown Caves could have been a misplaced account of the one in the Glen Park Cave, or there could have been multiple altar rocks and cave weddings. Some local histories also recall a boat trip in the Glen Park Commercial Cave. However, there's been no evidence of such a capable stream in the cave. The commercial cave has significant breakdown, though, and could be arranged differently than in the late 1890s. More notable than the commercial cave may be the various labyrinths or maze caves in Glen Park. While there are probably tens of thousands of feet of these caves, I cannot possibly begin to cover them in extreme detail, but know that they are multi-level, probably relating from water table changes over a massive geologic time span, that passages run in a crisscrossing, parallel, potentially confusing manner, and that our understanding will grow as more research and exploration takes place if possible. One of the factors hampering exploratory efforts is that at least two locations in the Glen Park complex are federally protected hibernaculum for endangered Indiana bats, whose population has been decreasing due to disturbance by winter caving and diseases such as white nose syndrome. There's a very short window in which caving could take place that would not critically disturb these vital populations, and for the most part, that is a risk that might not be worth taking. Other issues of access are liability related. There have been relatively recent expeditions, but they are few and far between. Even though the public may not be entering these caverns anytime soon, the knowledge of their existence and the stories that come from them still influence and animate local understanding of place. There are numerous other caves that have not been mentioned in this episode. I will have more information on them in the eventual book, but the main takeaway is that the caves of the Black River Basin, particularly in the city of Watertown and Glen Park, have a geological and cultural allure, drawing people in, spinning stories of fabulous chambers, miles of passages, basement entrances. Something persists in the desire to have a subterranean channel of roads and avenues invisibly linking neighbors, neighborhoods, the whole city. While this could be true, what we do know is that our understanding of the caves are intimately connected with the understandings of the Black River, and that these connections and associations come together to assist in the production of a Black River mythic, a mixture of knowledges and approaches, a folk historical perspective. For I have mapped this river, and I know its mighty force, and the courage
message that this gives me will hold.